Sure, and I just to for the formality, I'll take a roll call. Okay. Hartston. Here. Sarush. Here. Okay, thank you. So um, we, it looks like we have some, at, at least one person who wants to make public comment. If there's anybody else who would like to make pu public comment, please raise your hand using the, um, that functionality in the Zoom meeting. So for right now, let's, uh, we can hear from uh, Steph Carroll. If you wanna unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, and this public comment, how, is it a minute, two minutes? What do we have? Uh, well, since there's only you so far, I think we can allow for up to three minutes. Okay, thank you. I don't know if I'll, I'll take that long because I was anticipating it shorter. But um, um, yeah, I'd like to thank the working group for ensuring that there's an opportunity for public comment at these meetings. Um, we do appreciate that. Um, and I'd like to reiterate that public council remains opposed to the creation of a for-profit paraprofessional industry that will inevitably, in our view, confuse and damage our low-income clients. Um, I reiterate that there's nothing in the reports presented so far that would stop paraprofessionals from targeting the low-income clients that we serve. Uh, and we know that most paraprofessionals are going to set up shop in the heartlands of our low-income communities, targeting our monolingual Spanish-speaking clients and other vulnerable populations such as elders. There's no amount of regulation as we see it that's going to protect our clients from the harm that this for-profit industry will create. And I want to just take, for example, um, the situation I have with over 20 clients that I've had since 2014, who were victims of somebody called Stephen Syringa Ringo, who was an attorney. Um, he set up shop and was offering loan modifications to people and a huge number of clients paid over money, the last bits of money they had to try and get loan modifications. Um, and he basically defrauded them. He was ordered inactive in October 2014. He was disbarred in March 2015. And so far, not one of those clients has received a cent from the client security fund. Um, we're now you know, six years plus on from that. Um, it's not working for the attorneys that are being regulated and it's not gonna work for the paraprofessionals that are proposed to be regulated. We urge you to go back and do more data gathering and analysis um, and please target those who are at 400% of the federal poverty level. We'd like to see you ask them what they can afford and see if offering them the choice of, of being able to pay a less qualified paraprofessional but still at something like $75 an hour would make, would make any real meaningful difference to them being able to afford legal services of that person. We ask that you require a triage system to make sure that folks who qualify for legal services are directed to legal services. We ask that you have fee caps, but those are essential to prevent the exorbitant pricing that we know we're going to see. We ask you require experienced attorney supervision as part of any regulatory structure as a necessary safeguard for any paraprofessional program where legal advice is being conveyed. We recommend a pilot program and we recommend a thorough audit of any cases going through that pilot program to see how an experienced attorney would have analyzed that program and what they would have done. We ask all of this, but we, as I said at the beginning, we remain opposed to any attempt to create a for-profit paraprofessional industry. Thank you for your time. Anybody else, Linda? I don't see any other public comment. Sorry, I didn't realize that I was muted. There is no other public comment. All right. Do you want to advance the slide, Linda? We just sure. thought we... So once again, we just wanted to review what your subcommittee has determined is within your purview. This comes directly from the memo that was submitted to the working group on, for its October 29th meeting. Um, and I just have one more slide that shows for each of the topics that are included, the status of the recommendations. And as you can see that we've, 
your working group has come up with a recommendation for continuing education requirements. But beyond that, there are a number of outstanding topics that still need to be addressed. So I think we want to hear from you how you want to proceed with the next couple of, with this meeting and with the next couple of meetings that we have scheduled prior to the meeting end of the full working group in December. So I'm open to how you would like to proceed, but I think it would be helpful to finalize our recommendations on continuing education and financial responsibility based on comments and discussion at the last working group meeting. I think we're probably gonna have a, for financial responsibility, I think uh, two, two recommendations, but I think we could finalize what that looks like. And I would like to go down and talk about mandatory disclosures um, and fee limitations and, and things like that, mm -hmm. um, informed consent as well. Um, I think it makes sense for us to, to jump into those, but I, I think we should finalize sort of where we are. What do you, what do you think? No, I agree. And um, I think that maybe perhaps um, on, we start maybe with the continuing education because the both of us agree on that. And um, I wanted to ask, what does it take to finalize that? I mean, this is what we discussed before the large group meeting. Then we discussed it at the large group meeting. Um, and I'm just wondering what's left to sort of finalize that today. Nothing. Um, you would bring it forward to the uh, working group for a vote. Okay. We, didn't, we didn't do that last time. I don't know if there, I, I don't believe there's anything further that you intend to do here in terms of further specification. Mm -hmm. So if, if that's correct, I think this would be ready to go to the working group. And I'm not sure if it would go in December I and mean, kind of think about maybe a package of items instead of piecemeal, but. I think there was at least a request for us to consider that some of the CLE time be devoted to certain topics. I think Judge Yu had that. I have to go look at my notes that I think we said we would consider, but I think we're, I, I think both of us said that sounded like a good idea, so. Right, she was talking about trauma-informed training, which I 100% agree, uh, because I think there is a consensus that most of these new uh, professionals will be doing family law, will be picking family law as a specialist. That's a really, um, a hot area and that's where you they will be dealing with um, victims of domestic or survivors um, they may be helping uh, apply for restraining orders or um, work related work and I, I totally 100% agree with her that there should be some requirement for trauma-informed training having said that we don't right now require that for attorneys, uh, but at least for example, in our county, we, uh, the court offers trauma-informed training and it's a really hot topic area and I think a lot of attorneys take it anyway. Um, so I, I would totally agree with that. Do you wanna, you wanna specifically mention that as an area? Well, if it's gonna be required, um, maybe what we could do is have the baseline like we have in our current recommendations and ask the family law subcommittee mm -hmm. to think about if there's any specific trainings that they think, assuming family law is going to be one of the areas of practice that anyone certified to provide legal services in that area, mm -hmm. take certain required CLE every three years. And you know, trauma-informed training could be one suggestion, but I'm not a family law attorney, so there may be, a, you you know the area better than me if there's other areas. Yeah. Or again, maybe we defer to the specialist to say, in addition to sort of the, we, we said it needs to be in the practice area, but maybe it needs to be broken down even further. 100% agree. And uh, I do, I do um, uh, my specialty is family law. And I mean, right off the top of my head, I can see not only trauma-informed and responsive training, but um, maybe child support calculations, you know, and it could be other areas, but I want to leave that for the, for that, that discussion to the group. 
But then I also wanted to ask what other areas of specialty has been discussed, guys, other than family law? Um, housing, unlawful housing. containers, okay. and then a limited area of home ownership. Okay. Call right now. Um, Health care. And my, the reason I ask is maybe uh, the same question that Amos talked about should be asked of every uh, legal experts excuse me, specialization subcommittee, you know, what special credits do you think or training do you think that a, a paraprofessional who picks this um, area should have? If any, do we want to specify any? And that I would, agree. Oh, go ahead. It would be part of the 30 hours. It would be further specifying the 30, not an additional. Correct. That's right. Correct. That's right. Oh, yes. absolutely. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Or if there is trauma informed, we again, there might be things that take away from the 30 that we put in the other category of required. But yeah, we're talking about within the 36 hours, mm -hmm. every three years. So I totally agree with the other practice areas. The family law is the one that's working right now. So if there's going to be like a proposal of MCLE, maybe the first proposal could include the family law, whatever they say, whatever they suggest. So I think that makes a lot of sense. I agree. So we can approve this with just a comment that there may be some uh, uh, details added regarding any uh, specific training for area of specialty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. Can we that take was the, that the was the easy. I want to feel like we did something really quick. <laughs> we did the first five minutes. Woo! <laughs> so let me tell you, on financial responsibility, I reached out to Elizabeth uh, uh, on our working group, and I got the name of the bonding company that she and many LDAs and many immigration consultants use. Um, and so we unfortunately been playing phone tag for several days. I'd really hope to have talked to him before um, today's call. But I will talk to him to get some information. Um, I can tell you that in my my very in the way my mind is working now, for whatever it's worth, I've been thinking about having a bond requirement at least initially, while the client security fund slash restitution fund is capitalized, because it will take some time for there to be money in that fund. The, the, the bond is very affordable. We know this for the um, paraprofessional and assuming it provides some level of protection, which is yet to be determined. We know we need to further explore that. It seems like it would be a very good, at least interim measure while we're building up the restitution fund. So I just wanted to share my current preliminary thoughts and that I am uh, trying to get us relevant information um, about the bonding environment for LDAs and immigration consultants now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there uh, any, um, you know, listening to the speaker from today, and I read some of the notes I te took from the main meeting, um, as far as uh, the public comments, and I, I was just wondering if there's any evidence that um, majority of the people that use these services are in fact lower income, LEP, and they're more vulnerable than the average member of the public that hires an, hire, hires an attorney. Is there any evidence that we can back, back us up? You know, it would, it would, to me, it would, and, 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 you know, a lot of our members, the day of our large meeting, supported having consumer protection in this fashion. You know, and I wanna respect that. Um, I, uh, you know, after the meeting, I kicked myself. I said, I wish I would have asked the one question, why do you think that? And maybe we would have gotten some information about some study or something. I don't remember that your study, the studies that we have so far covered had any evidence like that. It's all anecdotal, right? Do you, do you evidence that people who take advantage of the current client security fund are low income or people, you know, people who use higher. a licensed paraprofessional? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, we don't have any evidence. Yeah. I think there's an assumption that if you can afford it, you'll choose to have hire an attorney, which may be true, but I, 
I do push back on that myself because I've shared many times like I make a very good income and I would find an attorney for a serious problem out of reach for me financially. So, but, you know, and I'm not low income. So I don't, I don't know, but I think there is an assumption. So just to be clear from, from my perspective, the requirements of financial responsibility, whether that's malpractice insurance, a bond or some sort of fund does not depend on how wealthy the consumer is. It is really for protection that the service provider, so the paraprofessional has assets in case they mess up. So in other words, uh, no matter what the wealth of the client is, if they're low income or if they have a, a significant assets, if they are harmed and they are victims, um, it doesn't help if you know, the person is no longer available to get financial uh, resources from, if they're gone, if they don't have assets. So this is some financial responsibility, which is very common for many different licensed professionals in California. Uh, it doesn't, you know, if you hire a, a you know, a, a painter or a plumber, it doesn't matter that whether or not the people who you know, use their services are low income or not, they're required to be bond licensed and bonded. Mm -hmm. in order to provide services in California. So I think it shouldn't depend on whether or not uh, this will be targeted at a certain demographic. The idea is for consumer protections, whoever the consumer is, this would provide some financial responsibility in the case of errors. Okay. I, and in my mind, again, I, I, I hate to repeat myself. I just wonder, so is it at the if it's really for protection of the service provider, are we leaving it to them to choose an option or we're making it mandatory and saying you need protection, get it? Because we're, according to what you just said, this is not aimed to protect the average client. This is really to protect the service provider. No, no, sorry. So I'm not being clear. Yeah. So, okay. so that might be a consideration in malpractice insurance of whether or not to require it. Um, but no, what I'm saying is it protects the consumer no matter who the consumer is. They don't have to be low income consumers. Uh, any consumer is protected by a license and bonding requirement so that they're not, it's just general consumer protection and very common for licensed professionals to have a licensure and bonding requirement. But not attorneys, right? Yes, but we're not talking about attorneys here. We're talking about- you know, I know that. I know that, but we're, we're allowing these folks to do every, almost close to everything that attorneys do, but for certain tasks and then limiting it to certain areas of specialization. So I'm right. just, again, in my mind, I'm just trying to justify why we're treating them differently. And it could be, we do a pilot, we'll see, or, or that we do this and we recommend the same for attorneys. I think Leah, you mentioned that in one of our meetings. Um, you know, I, I'm still just um, not comfortable with that thought of why are we requiring more of these people? Well, it wasn't that expensive. You know, when I heard it was really, the number was really low. Um, but now practice is going to be a bit, bit higher, yeah? Yeah, I think it's a closer call for me on malpractice insurance. So I agree. I think bonding is definitely something that I would like at least from my perspective, our recommendations to consider. We could discuss an amount, but oh, okay. um, for malpractice insurance, you know, as we've discussed, I don't know how expensive it would be. I don't know that it would be available. Um, I'm leaning towards recommending that it be required, but if it's not required, there needs to be some other type of, you know, restitution fund in my mind. So. But I, I agree, that's, okay. that's a harder question. It's not required of attorneys. It's, that is something that both protects clients and the professional. Mm -hmm. I'm practicing even as an attorney, I wouldn't practice without malpractice insurance for my own uh, yeah. Yeah. protection, yeah. but you know, it's, but I don't know. So, but, but for bonds, I think it's not expensive. It's a common requirement for licensed professionals. I see no reason why we wouldn't. Right. And I have to say when I heard that it wasn't, much of it didn't sound like much of a hardship because they're really not that expensive for the amount of protection that they provide so i would i would be more likely to agree to a bond and um, i read um 
this um, from state of Washington that the program is no longer in effect, but they required malpractice insurance, I think, 100, 300. Correct. Yeah, and they indicated that they would be, I think, interested in extending coverage to our paraprofessionals. Mm -hmm. And I believe they gave some rough dollar amount. But maybe, I don't know, Linda, we have another, I, I, I maybe don't have it teed up, but I think we have something else, maybe from the last meeting that shows where Amos and Freeba are on the various aspects of financial responsibility. Maybe yeah. it's from the October 29th meeting. Because I think, I think, my understanding is you're both in agreement on the restitution fund as it is equivalent to our current client security fund, right? Because that is required of attorneys. There's a question about whether or not we would require prior di um, final discipline the way that we do on the attorney side, right? And I think Amos, you have a more expansive vision where the prior discipline would not necessarily be required and then where the fund would also reimburse malpractice type losses. So I think if we could go to like, just understanding where the points of difference are. Um, and then on bonding, attorneys aren't required to have it. It sounds like you're both leaning towards it. We need to get a little bit more information. Mm -hmm. And I would just again, throw out there that we may also think about it as a, at least um, an interim, something that you can get right away up and running when your client security fund has no money in it, <laughs> because initially it's not going to have very much money in it. Right, um, right, right. No, I would say um, after finding out more information about bonds, as I said, um, I think there, the, the two types of professions are different enough, and there's at least a, a good chance that the clients may be more vulnerable um, than I think it's enough justification to require a bond. Um, uh, I would like to talk more about malpractice insurance. I think Amos, maybe not as much as I thought for malpractice insurance as a mandatory requirement. I think we need to talk a little more about that. And my um, position on the restitution fund is if we're gonna have a different type of structure, the administrative costs of uh, running it uh, to me were, um, were in, was uh, they were sort of prohibitive of creating a whole new structure and why not just join the structure that there is i do understand the difficulty with recovery and i mean the public comment from today i mean if that's that is a real case and people haven't been able to be reimbursed um uh in so long so uh, that kind of concerns me too but i just don't know if you create a new program how you know, efficient that's going to run and how quickly are people going to be reimbursed and how much overhead we're going to have. And, you know, a lot of the money is going to actually go towards managing it rather than reimbursing people. I, I don't know. Those are all the unknown factors. I, and I agree. So that's why I think where I ended up, uh, maybe these notes will show something different, but I think where I ended up last time when we were doing our report is I, I'm leaning towards mandatory recommending mandatory malpractice insurance especially if the fund has so many concerns about how it's going to be funded and administrative costs and if it doesn't eventually actually happen that there would be some protection like malpractice insurance i think a fund makes sense theoretically for me but in practice i don't know if it will be created and funded and i would hate to you know, have a restitution fund that isn't properly funded. So it looks like on paper it provides protection, but it in fact doesn't. I think that's worse than you yeah. know, having some alternative. So I think where I ended up because of all the concerns that were raised about administrative costs and issues with a potential restitution fund is maybe that means requiring malpractice insurance is, is a better alternative. I mean, I think we can propose all three of these issues in financial responsibility, a bond, malpractice insurance, and um, some sort of restitution fund. And I think the other area of agreement um, where we had before was if malpractice insurance isn't required, it should be recommended and we should take steps to encourage it. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe if 
if we're not going to do a fund or we think the fund isn't really going to provide protection for whatever reason, maybe that's another reason to require malpractice insurance. And if we don't require malpractice insurance, I think it should be disclosed in the disclosures that this power professional does not carry malpractice insurance. Even if we, if you don't require it. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. And then I was reading this um, letter from Kathy Pfeiffer Morgan. Uh, do you know which one I'm talking about? It was emailed to us is PA Lawyers Fund for Client Protection. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's from Linda. It, I think it's a write-up of her notes. Okay, right. So mm -hmm. that's, um, that fund, I mean, looking at her your notes, Linda, it seems like it was pretty easy to, uh, the process was, was not that cumbersome in terms of how they review claims and all that. Right. But that's for their, their uh, client fund, her uh, the attorney's fund for client protection is the equivalent to our client security fund. And it does seem really straightforward. And they, she said it was, um, from her perspective, this sort of proving theft or, you know, of funds, it's, she said it's not that difficult to prove. Okay. Is it possible to kind of model uh, if we decide to have a separate fund? model it after this where it's operated so smoothly? So it sounds like that's what Amos had in mind to have a fund that's like this that doesn't require discipline. And I think as as my you know my notes reflect, she said it they process their claims fairly quickly. So I think if we I I think the more challenging part is the malpractice. I think that would be much more challenging for determinations of malpractice to be made by a board like this. But I think the issue of eligibility for the for client security fund, the, the, the deliberate acts, it seems like it would not be that difficult to administer. And we could sort of take it out of the client security fund and have this be a separate fund. There still is the issue of um, it being capitalized. So if it's at the, in the first few years of the program, it's not likely to have enough funds to cover claims. But after a while, unless there are other sources of funds, unless there were some way to get some initial funding for that. But absent that, then I think Leah's suggestion about the bonds, um, although I don't know if a bond would cover the type of claims that the client security fund covers. Amos, you're more familiar with bonds, yeah? It'd be different claims? Only a, only a little bit, but and we've discussed this before. I have concerns that a bond doesn't really provide the same protection that a uh, fund would. Uh, and it might require a, a victim to you know, file litigation or prove their case in some other forum, whether that's through discipline or through a court case. I don't know that it's technically required, but a bond is basically like an insurance company. So they're not gonna want yeah. to uh, pay a claim unless it's proven in, in some way. I think they can you know, investigate it, but I, I'm, I'm going on the assumption that for, for clients of non-lawyer paraprofessionals, we don't want to require them to go out and hire an attorney if they have problems. Yeah, yeah. So, so mm -hmm. you know, a bond I think is helpful as, as a minimal protection, but I don't think it takes the place of you know any other forms of recovery like a, a fund. So can I just ask so, so we can get kind of concrete. It sounds like the under um, types of claims covered, we could strike unintentional errors and emissions because we, we're moving away from the idea that our, this fund administered by the state bar would potentially reimburse malpractice type losses because that, it, you know, I think we believe and we've heard that it would be very difficult to administer and very expensive. So I think that one could go. And then eligibility requirements, it sounds like this remains the same. Um, this is eligibility for the fund. Monetary. Losses reimbursed would be monetary first bullet, not the second bullet. And um, I don't see on this particular, this is all options regarding the fund. So then we have another separate bonding requirement 
and another separate potential requirement that the paraprofessionals have malpractice insurance. So right. I would be comfortable with that if we are recommending malpractice insurance required. I'm sort of seeing them as an alternative. If there's no requirement for malpractice insurance, I think these unintentional errors and omissions need to be included in the proposed fund. So it just depends, I guess, if we want to get on the same page for the recommendations for financial responsibility, or if we want to have sort of options for the our board of trustees to consider. Mm. If there is, if we leave it in here and make the malpractice insurance um, as an option, recommendation, um, and let's say the paralegal or the paraprofessional also gets malpractice insurance, is there a double coverage? Is it, I'm, I'm just trying to see, is there duplicity here where we're having a bond and they're having malpractice insurance or do they cover different things? So, so I think that the, I, I, my impression of how this would work is that the fund would want to be able to recover after it pays out a claim um, from the individual. And so I think the question is, you know, which is the easiest path for the consumer? Mm -hmm. Hopefully it will be this fund um, if we set it up correctly uh, and it includes those types of claims, but the fund might need to go after either the individual, so it doesn't go after the insurance policy, it goes after the individual and the insurance policy covers the individual. So, so it's a little bit complicated, we have to work through those issues, but I don't see any problem with having more coverage. It's like getting extra insurance. Um, you know, the insurance companies can fight between themselves, but the consumer is protected. So, so um, but, but I agree, I think the way it would work is the fund would need to be able to go after recovery of funds and there would need to be built in, um, you know, uh, due process rules for that. Uh, if it's not built in, uh, you know, in the initial claim, it, it would have to be built in when they go out, when the fund goes after recovery. Is the fund gonna go after recovery or we're only gonna require recovery for um, reinstatement of a license? Well, either, either, either way, I mean, we need to keep the fund solvent. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Certainly it makes sense to limit the license being renewed or being able to continue to practice without re reimbursing the fund. But again, there probably needs to be some due process built into that before you take somebody's license away. Right. I think this other fund does have due process built into it, notice, and there's they decide on paper, but if anybody wants a hearing, they, they can have a hearing. Right. So we can work on those details if we agree with, to the concept in general. But it's still expensive to administer, we're thinking. Well, I personally would not recommend that we set it up as a whole separate separate thing. Like I think the funds could be dis could be discrete discrete accounts, okay. but the staff that do client security fund, those are the staff that should handle these matters. You okay. shouldn't think about hiring a new set of staff. Mm -hmm. um, you have a client security fund commission. Now, most of a lot of the client security fund decisions are now made at the staff level. They are not made by the commission. That was a change that was made a couple of years ago. Because we aren't going to require final discipline, there may be a, a reason not to use that client security fund model on the for the for the paraprofessional um, process, meaning there may be a reason to have the equivalent of the commission approving every payout. So that's just a question that, that I have, but I, to the extent that we can leverage the existing infrastructure for the client security fund process, we should, while keeping the funding discrete um, so that we don't have to deal with this concern that attorneys are subsidizing paraprofessionals. Um, 
Yes. And I think that's how we would do it. I agree. But I, I mean, I think, I think what we talked about before was the, there would be some sort of paraprofessionals board created and that is, will be overseeing the discipline. Is that right? Is that still what's being contemplated? So I think it should be the same board that deals with claims to this fund. That's what I have in mind. Um, but I, but again, I, I don't know if we've hashed out exactly what that board, I think when we talk about um, mandatory disclosures and other requirements, I, I think we should leave some discretion to the board that is going to be created to have continuing oversight over that sort of thing. And so I think the board is the right place for this to sit. But again, I don't know if this is ultimately going to be created or not. I think leveraging the existing structure and staff makes a lot of sense. So I, I think we're just talking about who the ultimate decision maker is. Mm -hmm. OK. So it sounds like we are going to move forward with a client security fund or restitution fund. It's not going to address malpractice type of claims. It's not going to require a final determination of prior discipline. Also move forward with a bonding requirement and question mark, but likely going to require malpractice insurance. Or at least it'll be a not sold on that. So, yeah, highly recommend, and I would, uh, I would um, advocate for including a statement in their disclosures, uh, front and center, that uh, that they do not have practice insurance. Um, again, you know, depending on the cost, it may maybe just too much of a hardship to require that. And we don't require it from attorneys and we're providing two other ways, consumer protection tools. So I'm thinking maybe it is reasonable to not require it. Uh, and the client can make an intelligent and informed decision uh, knowing that this person doesn't have malpractice insurance. Do attorneys have to declare that? I don't know. Yes, yeah. they do. The, okay. the disclosure is in the retainer. Fine print. Okay. It's not a disclosure in an advertising or any way, any place where someone, where a consumer potential client would find that out prior to deciding to engage the attorney. Okay. So what I what I propose is that when this is presented in whatever package we put together for the working group, that it be a, a choice. Um, you know, because I, 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 from the last working group meeting, it seemed like it was very controversial, potentially very controversial to require malpractice insurance. So even if we recommended, there's no, no guarantee that that would make it passed. But, um, you know, to say, you know, maybe with a pro and con of requiring malpractice insurance, and if we don't require malpractice insurance, having this disclosure rules you're talking about, and we can talk more about what that looks like. But if there's no malpractice insurance required, I think the fund should, at least there be an option for the working group to consider whether the fund should uh, include errors and omissions too. And it'd be, I would recommend that it be not simply a vote, but explain uh, your, what, what are your justifications? What was your rationale? I'm really interested to hear that. Um, also, when we get to disclosure, I think they should, the disclosure should include that they have a bond and they have, you know, that the consumer knows what avenues they have um, to recover uh, should this person they're hiring not do a good job for them, uh, equivalent to a malpractice or theft or fraud or whatever. And Amos, if, if, if there is no mandatory malpractice insurance, then am I correct in understanding that you believe this fund should revert back to the original concept where it does reimburse malpractice type of losses? Correct. Okay. So Linda, do you have all that? All right. So we're going to get more information about- I went on mute. I don't know why, but I, I was just going to say, I agree with that, that it should be put back. And I don't know if you heard me. Sorry. Oh, you do? Okay. That if we don't require my practice insurance, I would say 
since we have it, we should add that in. Do you think okay. there's a difficulty to adjudicate? Um, yeah. For lack of a better word. I think yeah. I remember that comment from before. So before we jump off this topic, so is there a significant challenge to adjudicate or um, uh, determine liability? I think that's what we heard from Heather Rosing when she yeah. Heather, Heather um, Rosing had a very strong opinion on this and very strongly recommended mandatory malpractice and mm -hmm. insurance. And, and, and one of the reasons, I think she had several, but one of them was the cost and difficulty in, in funding of a fund to cover that. So mm -hmm. again, that moved me as well. I, I think there are significant challenges with a fund. And so malpractice, requiring malpractice insurance seems like a, mm -hmm. seems like a good choice. Mm -hmm. if there's no required malpractice insurance. I think my, my view is it should be included in the fund. And Amos, when you say that, that it should be included, then what about the challenge that it poses in terms of decision-making? I mean, is this commission going to be able to make those determinations relatively easily? I mean, I'm not talking about easy, but that it could Those are the challenges. So that's that's sort of the choice, right? We we my view is the consumer protection aspect of having some financial responsibility trumps the, all of this, right? We need to have something. Mm -hmm. The question is, what does it look like? I am being moved towards mandatory malpractice insurance. It is probably the easier way to uh, administer this program, and. Um, we have some concerns both about administration and funding and cost. So none of those I think exist in mandatory malpractice insurance. You have it, you have to have it and you have to prove you have it mm -hmm. and you're done. And then you, you don't have to deal with all these other challenges. There still would be a fund, but it's more limited to the similar fund that there is for attorneys and you don't have these additional challenges. So, so mm -hmm. that's where I am. So sorry if that wasn't clear, but I think, um, you know, it is costly to have mandatory malpractice insurance and it's not required of attorneys. And so you might not agree. And even if you do agree, the working group or the board of mm -hmm. trustees might not agree. And so I just want to sort of set it up with alternatives. Right. And if it's not, if unintentional error is not included in here, we don't uh, vote on having mandatory malpractice in coverage, then if a client hires a paraprofessional knowing that they do not have malpractice insurance, and that's the type of situation we have, if the person doesn't have malpractice insurance, what's the, what avenues are left for that client? They're out of luck uh, in probably most or all cases. The bond may provide some protection, but I don't think it would provide the same type of protection. We're going to learn more about that. So I think we're still proposing a bond. But my understanding is the bond wouldn't provide the same uh, protections and recovery as a fund or malpractice insurance would. But they, so, so most clients would, would, most victims, so just the ones where there is, you know, there is something wrong, very unlikely that they will recover anything. No, it's, it's like a lawsuit. They file a small claims case, depending on the amount or something like that, right? That's that they would go forward on their own litigated on their own, right? Well, right, but that's not the issue. They could do that anyway. The issue is even if they got a judgment, there would likely be no recovery. No way to recover, right, 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 right. right. And free, but that's how it is, right, for attorneys. Right. Don't have right. 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 I think, you know, there's like these really interesting policy issues. One, I totally agree with you, Frigo, when you keep pushing this point of like, why are we having different rules for this group of licensees than for attorneys? That's one policy question. Then the other is, should it malpractice insurance actually be required for attorneys? And so if you have the opportunity to kind of create a new program, and you, then you have the opportunity to do it right. So they're both like, you know, you know, why not go all the way, bonds and all that too. So my, my thing is that if the group votes to have malpractice insurance mandatory, then I think the recommendation should be that if everybody agrees that this should be pushed for attorneys too. I mean, consumer protection is consumer protection, you know, they should be protected from bad attorneys too. I think 
we're done with this part, right? <laughs> I think so. Okay. All right. So where do you guys put the other slide back up? Yeah. Tell us where you want to go next. Okay. It's going to take me a moment to find it. I kind of like disclosures next. Hoping that would be easy. Okay. Amos, do you want to discuss disclosures next? Sure. That sounds good. I really like the disclosures in the Washington program. I agree. I think they did a pretty good job. I mean, I think for disclosures, some of these need to be clear and conspicuous disclosures. And they had some language in Washington. I think we could probably do a little bit of a better job on some of that, but at least for the topics, uh, and maybe I'd reorder it, but at least for generally the idea of disclosures, first of all, a requirement that there be a written agreement signed by both the client and the paraprofessional, and you know, um, you know that they're not an attorney, and some, some, you know, what the services are. So I do think that's a good, very good starting place. I don't know if everyone on the call has this, but what uh, Fariba is referring to is APR 28 in the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. um, and that in particular, APR 28. Um, you want me to put that on the screen? That would be great if we're gonna start there, but I think it's G. It is G. Uh, that now? It's G2. But G1 is great. I love that um, this specific rule that the uh, legal technicians shall personally perform the authorized service as not delegate to a non-licensed person, except for translation. So this is what we're talking about, these- um, Yeah, right there, starting with A. So this is for the written agreement, and I think we should start with that. There may be other you know, ways of delivering mandatory disclosures, whether that's in advertising or on a website or some licensees require you know, posting on the wall, certain information. But so, so we can talk about other ways of delivering uh, you know, mandatory disclosures, but I very much like the the what Washington State did with their written agreements. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So this is where I'm just struggling a little bit, and maybe Greg jump in, because there are rules for attorneys regarding fee agreements, regarding several of the topics that are covered here. Not all of them w would. If we start off with Washington's and then revise as needed, is that a, is that a, an okay approach? Or should we start off with the rules, California rules for attorneys and revise as needed? That's what I'm struggling with. Yes, there, there are provisions in the State Bar Act requiring written fee agreements uh, between an attorney and a client with certain requirements in there as well. I can um, get that site for you. Yeah, what yeah. sections are they? It seems like there, there's some additional information, additional disclosures that go beyond what's required in the State Bar Act here. Yeah, there are. It's worthwhile to just capture what you, what you would like to include here, uh, and then we can refer to the, the State Bar Act provision. Let me find that. Yeah, 
51 to 47. That's business and professions code, yeah. Yeah. 47, 48. Let's do conducts of business. So, Greg, just so I understand what you're recommending, if we have, if we're going to come up with um, certain regulations for paraprofessionals that do not track attorney require current attorney requirements that have to do with the topics we're discussing, CLE, mandatory disclosures, informed consent, possibly some fee restrictions, whatever else is on our list. Um, does it make sense to have a rule specifically for non-attorney non paraprofessionals where we can cite to and refer to the attorney rules or do you have a different recommendation? Well, I, th I think that we, I think we need to decide, uh, what I would suggest that you do is decide what you, what types of topics need to be disclosed, whether they need to be in separate writing. So for instance, we were talking earlier about uh, somebody that does not have uh, malpractice insurance. Currently, um, currently a lawyer can disclose that in a retention agreement and very often it's buried. It's one of the major criticisms of that rule is that it's not very effective because it's not clear and conspicuous to a lot of people. And so the idea that they're making an informed decision to employ an attorney who they know has no malpractice insurance uh, you can call that in the question, um, especially since they're not aware of it usually until they're about to initiate representation rather than when they're shopping around. So, um, so I, I would suggest that we, I, I, I think this is a good starting point to go through here because I did the, the Washington rule, because I think there are a number of things here um, that are not required of attorneys in California and if you feel like this, these are important public protections for this partic particular type of licensee, we should include that in, in terms of where all of this lands. It, I mean, it probably makes sense for it to land in a rule of professional conduct for the paraprofessionals. Um, and then when we get to that topic on how are we going to either adapt to current rules of professional conduct or have a new set of rules that are based uh, largely on, on our rules for lawyers. Uh, we, can, we can decide how to, how to structure that. Um, the rules for legal, legal fees for attorneys is 1.5. So there's some, some information there that we might wanna look at too. Um, but I, I would suggest so we don't get bogged down that you, you go through this rule here and see if there's anything you wanna capture right now as a concept. Um, for disclosures for the paraprofessionals. That makes a lot of sense. And what I was recommending, but obviously you, you know the rules of professional conduct very well. What, what the state of Washington appears to do is they have their rules of professional conduct for their triple LTs. I assume they created that off of the, what they have for attorneys. I haven't gone through and carefully examined it, but they have a separate rules of professional responsibility or rules of professional conduct for their triple LTs. And then they have this APR 28, which goes through not only these types of regulations specifically for paraprofessionals, but also it's where they house, you know, what, what topics, right? Is it family law? Is it what things can be done in appendix there? So we're going to have to house all of that somewhere. And it seems like we're going to have to house that separately from the rules of professional conduct, at least some of it, in terms of, you know, what's the board, who's the member, what are the requirements of education and licensure? So I'm not sure conceptually where that all goes, but it seems like that might be another place for some of these rules, which are not just discipline, but, you know, defining the program. And, and, and they could, I mean, they have in the past sometimes been created by statute, but also our, our multi-jurisdictional practice rules are all rules of court under Title IX of the rules of court. So that may be a, a place that, you know, those types of uh, rules setting forth the requirements and scope and parameters of the program where that th those set of rules live. Mm -hmm. I see that um, the 
section 60, uh, starting with 6146, um, the title is fee agreements. So, and a lot of these sections tend to cover, you know, fees, con contingency fees and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Where the Washington rules, the disclosures here really are, most of them are kind of trying to cover the differences between what this person can do versus an attorney can do. Mm -hmm. And I also haven't looked at their rules regarding attorneys, so I don't know what they do, what they have in their rules for attorneys. But um, I think that's why there needs to be this different set of rules for the just applies to paraprofessionals and addresses disclosures about what they cannot do. Um, and, and if we're not requiring malpractice insurance, then that they don't have malpractice insurance. And remind me again, I'm so sorry, I forgot. Are we requiring attorneys to declare that they don't have insurance? Then yes, yes, yes. okay. Okay, so that would be the same, you know, if we go that route. But right. I do think there is a purpose for having a separate section. Maybe we'll just sort of put it in the same section in the business of profession course, but it only applies to paraprofessionals. Right. The, the difficulty with that is only the legislature can change the business oh, of profession yeah. code. So yes. I forgot that little possible, part. <laughs> it's a possible way to do it, but it, it might be easier if the Supreme Court, I, I don't exactly know the procedure for changing the rules of court, but I assume it's a Supreme Court decision instead of a, a legislative decision. So do you want to take the Title time? Nine, the Title IX rules are pretty, it's a lot of flexibility for the court in terms of the process. They're not this, the same as uh, Title X rules, which require a process through the, ju through the judicial council. But uh, isn't it true? People can recommend rules. The state bar can recommend rules of court uh, governing the admission and uh, in to the practice of law under Title IX. Um, so there's a lot more flexibility there. And one, one thing I, I'll just mention, just, so it, the, the rule for disclosing uh, the absence of malpractice insurance is 1.4.2. Um, and one thing you'll see when you go through the rules of professional conduct is uh, th there are many different instances in which lawyers are required to obtain informed written consent um, before they do something, uh, wh whether they're splitting fees with another lawyer um, so that, unfortunately, that, you know, there's not one place that you can look to, to know all the different ways, all the different things that you need to disclose to a client, because they're really situational and they appear throughout the rules. Yeah. Um, but it, in terms of initiating the relationship, um, I, I think that you have an opportunity here I, to follow this, what, what Washington has done, which is really to make sure that these paraprofessionals know at the initiation of the relationship, these are the things you need to obtain, do you need to disclose in writing and obtain consent to, uh, and the scope of what you can agree to as well. Mm -hmm. One thing, Fariba, I mean, not to get off on a tangent on this, but it, and I think Linda had brought this up, the, the criticism of the, um, of the disclosure rule for the absence of malpractice insurance, one of the main criticisms of that is that the way these insurance policies work, they're claims made policies. So you may, you may actually have insurance when you initiate the relationship. And it's, for many clients, they may have discover that they are a victim of malpractice after the relationship has ended or uh, at, a, at, at some future date. And at that point, if the, if the professional is not insured, then they're, they're in a tough spot because it's really, you know, it's, you have to have insurance at the time the claim is made, not when that representation happened. Okay. okay. Do you all want to go through item by item and say which one you want to keep or modify? And then I think we could do the a stop, just cross-reference to our existing rules. Sure, there are not that many. Yeah, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's think it's a yes. So um, 
did we decide who's deciding that uh, whether they can represent them in court or not you all are i think that's as yet to, that's that was us too no not you the working group the working group oh the entire oh, we haven't made a decision on that yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my my suggestion is we go through this just like we're about to, and in, and and lean on the include it, and we kick it back to the working groups that are working the subcommittees that are working on particular areas, and if they're going to recommend something different, you know, obviously we got to change that. But I think the idea is the Washington State rules appear to have a pretty good, clear and regulation of things that need to be disclosed that I think we should track unless there's some reason to divert. Again, there's some places where I might want to add uh, or change the order or things like that, but um, I don't think we should worry yet that the, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, because we keep getting into that problem with the regulations versus the topics. And I think we should move forward with this subject to it being revised if the other committees decide, oh, actually in this in family law, we want the, the paraprofessionals to do X, Y, or Z. We could always modify this. The only thing I would say is the group did already vote on collateral criminal, and there there was a um, recommendation approved by the working group that would authorize in court representation. So I think it's fine to do it, but I would hi highlight that that issue represent the client court probably, unless that previous decision gets undone, this is already inconsistent. Okay. So, well, so A, the other way is I, what I, they cannot do. I mean, A pretty much is an explanation of services on what they cannot do, right, Amos? I mean, that's what I'm reading. Yeah. So I think the way the Washington state rules work is separate. This G2 is their written agreement and disclosures, and they have a separate um, under uh, under H, the next section, which is prohibited acts um, that list um, things that they're not allowed to do. So this again is just disclosures, which of course might might track other <laughs> prohibitions. Mm -hmm. um, so my recommendation for A to A is that we separate it out. So. Um, I don't know if we're wordsmithing here because I'm happy to do this separately if we're, we're doing it, but I think an explanation of the services to be performed should be its own requirement, maybe even a clear explanation of the services to be performed. And the including part here, I think, again, I think this is gonna be a clear and conspicuous statement that they're, that they're and, um, So this is sort of a mandatory disclosure, right? That we're going to be required, you know, and we'll we'll want it. So I just want to make it as clear as possible, and that's different than the services. I, I see there's two separate concepts in A. An explanation of the services to be performed, I think, is great, and then separately a clear and conspicuous disclosure or statement of what they, you know, may not do, right? Mm -hmm. Right, I agree. Okay. And I think we could leave it at that for now. Yeah. Right, so that's A. Yes, B. So is that closely tracking what attorneys have to do? Basically identification of all fees and costs to be charged to the client for their services to be performed? So, so I think Greg, it looks like Greg's looking that up. While Greg's looking that up, I'll say that is, I don't think that's the right analysis here. Again, all of these things are maybe even specifically because they are different for paraprofessionals is why I think we need to specify it. If it's required for attorneys, presumably when we go through the rules of professional conduct, it's gonna be included. But this is the idea from, from my perspective of the idea we're doing here is for paraprofessionals, there are certain mandatory disclosures and certainly the fees and costs that will be charged should, in my opinion, be one of them. So, so 
Um, and that's why I say, I think we should go through these and, and exclude them only if there's some real reason, like it doesn't apply at all in California or there's a separate rule that already requires it. But my sense is, you know, if we're gonna require mandatory disclosure of what the services are, that they're not an attorney and what the fees are gonna be, seem to be high on the list of what needs to be disclosed. Is the parallel rule, Greg, rule 1.5? 1.5, and just to, just to clarify, so the, 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 fee, the fee agreements that have to be in writing really are contingency fee agreements, but in practice, um, and 1.5, so 1.5 prohibits a, an attorney from charging what we call an unconscionable fee. Most, most people follow the, most other states follow the ABA model rule, which is an unreasonable fee. We've re retained unconscionable um and really reserve the reasonableness of a fee for mandatory fee arbitration um or any other civil dispute regarding attorney's fees but you'll see on, under 1.5b it set forth a, a number of um factors that are considered when there's a there's a when a client claims that they've been charged an unconscionable fee and in practice most attorneys as you as you probably know do enter into retention agreements um, where they try to make sure that they are complying with a lot of these factors, or at least that if the factors would go in their, in their favor. So they're in practice, a lot will, you know, try to disclose all the fees and costs that will be charged uh, in plain language and it's set forth in the written agreement. Um, and then they also fold in some of these other required disclosures like absence of mandatory malpractice insurance in the same agreement, if okay. that makes sense. Okay. And so I, one, of the, one, one of the ways that we could compare this to what attorneys are required to do is by looking at the, the unconscionability factors under uh, 1.5B. 1.5B. So I think- Sessions Code 6148 does require a written agreement if for uh, fees in excess of $1,000. Yeah, that's true, right. Mm. So, and that, it doesn't require, it says they, they have to include the basis of compensation, including hourly rates and statutory fees and flat fees, um, the general nature of legal services to be provided. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it doesn't, they don't have to specify the exact amount, just has to say the basis for the fees. Basis for, yeah. yeah, Amos, what you think- Which business and professions code was that? 6148. Are you thinking, Amos, that they would, um, be disclosing like the maximum fee that they would charge for doing the work versus my hourly rate is a hundred dollars an hour. So we haven't talked about fee limitations, but I'm assuming that it will be allowed to have different fee structures, an hourly fee or a flat fee or, or some, some other things. So they just have to disclose what the fee is going to be. If it's an hourly fee, they have to disclose what that is. Mm -hmm. if it's a flat fee, they have to disclose what that is. Um, I'm just, again, I think we do need to separately talk about fee restrictions and limitations, but for this purpose, I think it's a disclosure issue. But when you say the fee and what that's going to be, you mean the hourly rate, not the total amount? Unless it's a flat fee arrangement, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is this, um, I, I think I'm understanding what Amos keeps saying um, in that, are we talking about are we talking about a fee agreement and disclosure all put together as this written document? Yeah, so this is a retail. So the way this is structured right now in Washington state, uh -huh. their retainer agreement includes the disclosures. Okay. So this is what we're talking about is a, a, a written agreement that includes disclosures. Again, I think we might need to talk about disclosures in other ways too, in advertising and on a website and yes. maybe post it on the wall, but at minimum, the written agreement the retainer agreement should, I like Washington's model of having, you know, sort of, you know, what's, what are the services, what are the fees, and a disclosure, they're not an attorney, and, and these other things. I, I think this is basic, we might want to add to it, but I, I'd be hesitant to, to not require them to disclose what their fees are. Mm -hmm. And today you want to just discuss it as like bullet points without going into too much detail? Sure. Or, or should we, you know, cite everyone and then discuss some detail and then before moving on to the next bullet point? Well, yeah, I think I think what we're doing is running through them to see if we have sort of an agreement. And then it sounds like um, 
there's going to be some cross-referencing of what's already included in the rules for attorneys that we may want to like for this one for identification of all fees and costs to be charged i like that i like that language it's simple and clear to me if there's some cross-reference or if we want to also include some of the you know unconscionability factors or if we want to do something more or i think that's fine too you mm -hmm. could have a placeholder for it but my point is i like this disclosure i think it definitely something I'd be interested in including. Greg, just a point of clarification. Um, the unconscionability factors are not required to be listed in an attorney fee agreement either. You're just saying that's the standard, right? It just becomes a checklist along with, with the requirements of 6148, a checklist for what you really should include in, in your retention agreement. Okay. Okay, so are we ready to go to TC? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And this one actually is important, I think. Um, it may not seem obvious, but I do know that there are sometimes disputes about client files and documents where they're sort of held hostage unless you give me some yep. you know, disputed fee or some, you know, something. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to give you your, your own documents uh, or your file. And so I think Again, I'm not sure what it is for attorneys, but I think something like this makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. and, and that's covered under the rule of professional conduct rule 1.4, communication with clients. You can request your file, as well as at the termination of the re representation. I think that's rule, I should know, so it's out of my head. I think it's rule 1.2. What was the first section, Greg? 1.4. 1.4? Uh huh. So I guess part of what we'll need to do is make sure whatever language we have in the disclosure mm -hmm. actually tracks what the rule what the rule requires. Yeah. I like this disclosure and I like the rule. Yeah, I do too. And I just want to say in H, prohibited acts, it has a, a number three talks about um, uh, prohibited acts shall not refuse to return documents supplied by the client, and even if there's a fee or dispute. And I'm just wondering how, and if we don't want to get into it today, that's fine. How specific do we want to get that they shall not? Attorneys, can attorneys charge a fee for m making copy of a client file to give it back to them? Or now that everything's virtual, maybe that's not a problem. But um, I thought there was a section that said attorneys have to provide the copy upon request and you can't charge them for copies, making copies. And whether we want to address this and also in- No, actually it, attorneys uh, can charge, can charge. Um, if you okay. look at comment two to rule 1.4, okay. lawyer may comply with paragraph A3 by providing a, the client copies of significant documents by electronic or other means, a lot, a lot of client, a lot of attorneys are doing it electronically now, which avoids the cost of copying. But uh -huh. if someone insists that this rule does not prohibit the lawyer from seeking recovery of the lawyer's expense in any subsequent, I, so I think you he, you can charge copying if they're insisting on paper copies. Okay, okay, and then the second question is: Do we want to address what's addressed in H three at the end? where it says, even if there's a fee dispute here. I mean, it seems like Washington doesn't, and then they have a list of prohibited acts. What do you think, Amos? I'm not sure I understand the question. So, so H, look at H3. Yeah. It's down. sort of similar to the, except it's specifically uh, refers to returning documents supplied, prepared for, or paid for by client. But then at the end, it says they have to return it even if there's a fee due, if there's a fee dispute. Yeah, that, that that's the same for lawyers as well. Right. And I'm just wondering, do we want to cover that hostage. in in C? So I think in, in G, in C. Yeah. So my understanding of how this works is G, the one we're going through yes. line by line, is yes. disclosures, whereas prohibited acts the H is the rules. So, so yeah, I think 
I think we should decide what we need to, what should be disclosed in the written agreement in G. Mm -hmm. um, and it should track what the rule is. Right. <laughs> you know? right. So is it important for the client to know that the uh, power professional cannot withhold exactly. documents? And we want to make it as clear. These piece. disclosures need to be as clear, right. clear in, uh, as, as possible. Uh, and yeah, so, you know, the right to have a copy of your documents in your file, I think should be one of the mandatory disclosures. And I, I'm not wedded to this language, but I, I think that should be a disclosure. Agreed. Okay, so basically you're saying to combine the disclosure provision with the prohibited provision, to beef it up, beef up the disclosure. Well, one by one, I'm just referring to this one particular. Yeah, with respect to the fee, to return of client file. Yes, even if there's a fee dispute, I think that's significant information because a lot of people I deal with here tend to think they cannot ask for anything if they owe their attorney money. Um, right. and I think that's really important to know. No, you, you have a right to get your documents back. Yeah, that's great. Okay. All right. Okay. D. So this is one that I, I think we should change the order. I think this should be oh. right up top yeah. that they're not an attorney. <laughs> and again, yes. a clear and conspicuous disclosure. So again, I like the idea, but I, I would just change the order. I, I, and I think we could probably work on what does clear and conspicuous mean? I don't know if the attorney rules have anything like that, but again, there's other clear and conspicuous disclosure requirements under California law that we could create our own if we need to. Uh, but this is obviously very important. I agree. And I think this does say this statement shall be on the first page of the contract, uh, but I don't know if why they have it as D instead of A. Right, right, exactly. It should be up front. And, and they do have some language about minimum font, but at least in my experience, clear and conspicuous is... It's interesting. It says minimum 12 print bull type print. <laughs> yeah, again, so we can, I think we can come up with our own either, again, if there's something existing in California law, we want to track, but I think there's probably more specific, more specific details of, of how and where the disclosure needs to be made. Okay, that was okay. easy. The duty of confidentiality. Are you all going to be recommending that there is um, confidentiality between the paraprofessional and the? I, yeah, I think we should track. Yeah. So confidentiality and privilege, I think, might require a statutory change. I don't know if we can do that in rules. Again, this is interesting. I, I think I would like there to be confidentiality and privilege. But I don't know if we can create that as a, uh, you know, as a regulation unless it's created somewhere. At, at least my understanding of the privilege for attorneys is a evidence code. Evidence code, right? The, the privilege is the duty of confidentiality appears in sixty sixty eight E, E one, and you know it, it's it's California is unique in this way in that it, this, the legislature created the duty of confidentiality before the court did. I mean, it was recognized in common law, but so historically the Supreme Court um, has been low to get ahead of the legislature in terms of carving out exceptions or expanding the scope of the duty, um, even though it, you know, arguably the court would have the authority to do that and pose that duty on lawyers as the you know, plenary authority over the over the practice of law in the state, but the court has um, really wanted the, to follow the legislature on that. So the, one of the exceptions under 6068E2 um, in cases of potential death or bodily harm for, for breaching the duty of confidentiality, the court in, denied, I think, four different requests to amend one, what is now 1.6 because we have both a rule, of a rule that sets forth the duty of confidentiality in California and a provision of the State Bar Act. Yeah. Um, and the reason the court 
continue to deny that request was because the legislature hadn't made the change yet. And as soon as the legislature made the change, then we approved the change in the rule. So that, that's just a little bit of background just in terms of the historical development of the duty of confidentiality mm-hmm. there. I mean, in concept, the court could create a duty of confidentiality imposed on uh, paraprofessionals through rulemaking. Um, but I'm not sure that you know the historical development of the of that duty um, would follow that pattern. Right. And what about privilege, though? Because um, that's different, right? That's if they're subpoenaed or if they're you know asked to testify, that they don't have to, and that's different than a professional responsibility of company. That's right. Right. So yeah, I think that we may have to kind of work on privilege, but. Rules of professional conduct for attorneys, 1.6, you said, covers duty of confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And and then, so could there be, and forgive me if this is the sounds ignorant, but could there be something in the rules of court um, that um, kind of says that the confidentiality rules that apply to attorneys will apply to um, paraprofessionals? Is that well, possible? You, you probably do that through the, duty, through the rules of professional conduct for the paraprofessional. Okay. And yeah. then or just the work on changing legislation as the program is developed and changing in privilege, you know, evidence goes for privilege and, and things like that. Because I think privilege is, I don't think we can, do you think you could do that in, it only has to be done in evidence code, right? I mean, you can't, you don't have a rule of court for privilege, do you? I mean, is there? And that's totally it is a, it, it, the attorney client privilege is memorialized in the evidence code. Um, okay. So if yeah. you wanted to have a similar protection for evidentiary protection of that information, confidential communications between a client and a paraprofessional. Right. For the same one policy. area where we probably would need to have some help from the legislature. Legislative. That's what I thought. Okay. So what I would recommend is that we do uh, include a duty of confidentiality in the rules and have a big big asterisk highlighted that, you know, we also want to recommend that we, uh, we, we take steps to create a, a, a parallel privilege. No, I agree. Uh, same policy reasons, you know. And included yeah, in all sorts of conflict. Work, work product protection as well. Right. I thought I read some. Well, work, work product yeah, it would have to be. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And work product is laid out where for attorneys, Greg? It's in the evidence code here. I'll find that description section. You can talk among yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like we want to keep. Um, 2e yeah we want to keep 2e we're just uh, we're just identifying that there are other things that need to be put in place in order to make that viable correct and it sounds like three things one is a professional rule of conduct that deals with confidentiality which it sounds like we can do and the other are the privilege and work product which maybe require statutes Mm-hmm. And we could put that on our to-do list. I mean, or your to-do list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, work product is in the, the code of, well, we have a code in the code of civil procedure 2018.030. Okay. So now we're talking CCP we're as well. Absolute, okay. absolute and qualified protection. Okay. Okay, can we get through one more? Yes. F. Unearned fees. Oh, were you, are you speaking over F? No, I'm in F. Oh no, you're F, sorry, 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 yeah. (laughs) So I like this as well. Um, Again, this is a disclosure. So the idea is, um, well, we got, we, I, I think we need to, also talk about retainers and if that's gonna be allowed and if we're gonna track the rules and how we're gonna deal with fee limitations. But Mm -hmm. certainly the idea that, you know, 
can't keep unearned fees <laughs> is pretty pretty clear and straightforward to me. So I, I would like to include it, but I, I also think we might want to seriously consider not allowing uh, at least significant retainers. So that that is covered under Rule 1.5D and E in, in terms of flat fees as well. So a true retainer, you can they can only designate a fee as earned upon receipt or non-refundable if it's true retainer, mm -hmm. meaning you're paying for the for the availability of the professional. Not uh, it's not the same as a deposit or advance fee, um, which a lot of lawyers still call retainers, but Mm -hmm. um, it's truly should be designated as an advance fee and they're required to return any unearned fees uh, at the termination of the representation. Right. So the, in other words, even if we track the attorney rules, this disclosure would be appropriate because any to the extent there's any unearned fees that need to be returned. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I agreed. The question that arose for me is this language right to rescind the contract. Are we talking about firing the power professional? This is what we're talking about, right? I no longer need your services, you're out, right? Um, and so this kind of reminded me of um, attorney withdrawal of the case, uh, from the case. I was just kind of thinking about that. I don't want to get us too far off from our discussion, but it just, rem so are we talking about notice to withdraw or, you know, motion to withdraw or substitution of power professional, you know, what are we, are we going to talk about that? Is that what the Washington people are referring to when they say right to rescind? So there could be a unilateral decision to relieve the paralegal power professional where we don't have that right in, in the CCP for, for, clients of attorneys, there has to be a agreement or there has to be a motion, a court order. So I think the, the difference is who's asking for the attorney to be relieved. If it's the client, the client can always fire their- I thought so. You know, I write registration as part of my work and I was trying to kind of decipher that as CCP 285. And it actually says that they, they both have to consent or the client has to file a motion if you read it. So I've been trying, I wrote legislation, but I haven't been able to get a sponsor. <laughs> so I, was, I agree with you. I think the client, which judge is gonna say to a client, no, you cannot fire your attorney, yet the code requires a court order. Um, so, if there's so this no, is, yeah. I'm not familiar with that, but I'm glad you are because this might be, if that is true, Mm -hmm. then this might be some place where we want to divert from the attorney rules because this is a, not an attorney, it's a licensed professional. And if the client wants to fire them, I think we should make sure that the, the, the client can do that. So the question for me then is, are paraprofessionals uh, required to make a general appearance? To Do they make a general appearance? I mean, if you look at um, number four here, G4, uh, sorry, four, um, it says how the paralegal or the paraprofessional is supposed to um, uh, identify themselves, right? So are they making a general appearance or not? Then if they make a general appearance, do the same rules apply to the opposing counsel? That is, they can only talk to the paraprofessional and not to the client. Uh, have we thought about this before? Or is some other group addressing it? I think that's <laughs> us. That's, that's you. <laughs> that's and, it, that's rules. and it's 502. <laughs> so uh, um, what would be helpful for us to do between now and the next meeting? Because the, the way we're doing this is very thoughtful, but it's going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so is there anything we can do that will help? Um, I like the way we've been doing this today, one by one. It's been very helpful with Greg providing the codes and all that and sections. I think it's just going to take time. I think, I think it's the nature of it. But hey, I'm, I'm open to all kinds of suggestions. 
I'm also, I, I mean, it looks like, I really like that we started with the Washington State rule and, and that we have, I think, agreed that all of it or most of it with some minor, you know, tweaking makes sense. Um, so it might be possible for us to go through this offline or, or, or redline it or, or, or maybe uh, look to see if there's anything that we want to have more discussion of, but quickly go through them next time. Um, and, and, you know, just highlight the ones that we need to spend some time really thinking about, because I, I do think, uh, at least as a baseline, the Washington State ones are proving to be pretty helpful. Okay. I agree. Great. Thank you. So do we want to, are we doing another meeting like this to continue our discussion or what's the decision? We have two more meetings scheduled. We have a meeting scheduled on December 1st and another one on December, I think it's the 7th. Okay, could you go back to the main list? So we have, we're right now on disclosures, but there were like four other items that we hadn't decided. And I think for next time, if you have them more information on the bond, it might be helpful for us to finalize what our recommendations are on that, including the amount, but, um, you know, hopefully that won't take too much of our time. Okay. Yeah, I think we have a good agreement on that. Okay. Ethical standards, I thought we, did we not make a decision that we wanna just track uh, on the task that par paraprofessionals can perform that attorneys also can perform that we track the rules of professional mm -hmm. conduct. No. It's yeah, probably I think going to require a little bit more work than that. Oh, <laughs> it's it's also probably going to depend on. I mean, like so many parts of this process, a lot of it's going to depend on what we decide these paraprofessionals can do, what their scope of practice is as well. Um, but so some of the rules, obviously, I think like the competency rule or the diligence rule will just yes. you can apply to them without much change whatsoever. But when we get into these, the, the rules governing fee agreements, transactions between pecuniary you know, interest in, in a, uh, involving clients and the, maybe even some of the conflict of interest rules, which there are many, um, we may have to either say certain rules don't apply or, or apply more strictly. So um, I may have soft sell, sold it last time that it was gonna be, <laughs> it was gonna be easy. It, it is a bit easier than it would be if you were starting from scratch just because we just revised them two years ago. But um, mm -hmm. I yeah. think it would be helpful if we could get Randy Defenturum involved in the process as well, because I think he could help us winnow down what are the major issues and in, in the rules. But he's probably going to want some of this other information as well in terms of what is this, what, what, what are we talking about in terms of scope of practice and things like that? And what, what are they permitted to do and not do? We and don't to, forget the great part he did do for us. I've been looking at during this meeting. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, where he looked at the RPCs Right. And then he cross-referenced it to um, Washington, Arizona, Utah, and made a recommendation about what to do for our program. Oh, he did. I didn't see that part. Oh, yeah. Okay. I saw, well, that, he, I saw that he said amend with some, but I, uh, the next step would be what are, what are the major policy issues underlying any changes that we would need to make? And um, but I, can, I can talk to Randy a little bit more about that, too. Yeah, and we can resend this. I think it's good. He has, you know, yes, keep it, yes, keep it, but adapt it. And then if he has adapt, he kind of puts a question, like here's here's what you need to think about in deciding how to adapt it. Okay, I don't think I have that one then. Okay. And remind me, what is proactive risk-based regulation again? That's a big one. That is um, uh, where you would establish essentially reporting requirements and you may establish an audit process so that you're looking sort of proactively at performance, not waiting for um, a, you know, a complaint driven process. And Linda provided you, I think with yes. information from the Ontario program where they do that. Yes. 
So I that see. might be one where some staff time on a on proposals might be helpful because maybe we don't need to do what we're doing with these disclosure rules, mm -hmm. with yeah. the audit rules and have some sort of proposal. And I would like to see, I, I think we definitely should include something like that. I also think, you know, data sufficient to provide to, to perform some sort of evaluation of the project would also be helpful for, so not only for, you know, discipline, but also evaluation. And I don't know exactly what that would look like, but maybe if we could, if, if we have a starting point, that could be, that could save us time. Okay. I agree. I agree. Yeah. 100%. Okay. Great. So we'll just continue with this discussion on, on December 1st, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, have a nice Thanksgiving, everybody. You too. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you.